And welcome to our Asia Trend series. Uh, this is by now the third of our uh, the third of the fourth, third of the public uh, seminar series. Uh, let me first say a few words about RE for those of you who are attending our event for the first time before I introduce the speakers for tonight. Uh, the Asia Research Institute is an academic research institute at the National University of Singapore. Uh, and we are quite different from the rest of the institute that you hear about a lot, such as the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, the Institute of Policy Research. We are actually different in a very fundamental manner. We are not a think tank. Uh, in that we do not actually uh, do work just for public policy purposes. <coughs> we, are, we are probably the singularly the purely academic research institute in Singapore. Uh, which means that we are actually, we have a huge amount of freedom to design our own research programs and uh, uh, Point different business people on the basis of what is interesting academically rather than what is useful politically. So, uh, in the institute itself, uh, there are six different areas of research that are that forms the major focus of the work that we do. Uh, they are religion, which is an important uh, institution within this whole region, not just in Singapore. Uh, so religious and globalization, uh, cultural studies in Asia, of which I am the cluster leader, uh, Asian urbanism, uh, and uh, family, Changes in the family, migration, and of course, science, technology, and society. In each of these clusters, there are each cluster has about five to seven research fellows at any one time, from those who are just out of university as postdoctoral fellows to very senior professors who are here for short term uh, as Professor Iwan Hong. Okay, so we are quite a busy place uh, in that we have approximately 30 to 40 research fellows at any one time in the place. And therefore we organize a lot of events of which uh, the Asia Trends is what we do once a year as outside the university outreach program. Regularly, we, have, we of course have weekly seminars, but more importantly, we also have month, practically every month one or two international conferences or workshops on different topics. So it's an extremely busy place. And fortunately, most of the workshops and uh, conferences eventually gets published either in journals or in book form. The Asia Trends series basic is actually a reflection of the different clusters work in the Asia Research Institute itself. That's why it's, there's no single theme. Every, uh, every uh, lecture, every evening lecture is in fact uh, delivered by prominent professors in the field. And, uh, the discussion and the topic tends to reflect the, one of the major issues that are developing within the field itself. So for tonight, we have uh, a lecture on science, technology, and society. The speaker tonight, the main speaker tonight, is Professor Hong Ai Wa, Hong Ai Wa Hong, uh, who is. Uh, 
originally from Malaysia, from Penang, of which she's very proud, and of her home also of her Peranakan heritage, of which she's furious about how it has been commoditized. Uh, she received her PhD from Columbia University and is currently Professor of Social Culture and Anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, her work is very hard to actually characterize because she's a great <coughs> snatchers of opportunities in that when she discovered emerging areas that interest her, she could fairly quickly organize research work around, around that particular focus. And therefore, when, if I look at her publications, which are many, uh, one will see a kind of very speed, very quick moving sort of uh, work, uh, mind at work. But nevertheless, broadly speaking, it has uh, as a, as a collection of topics, but interaction of capital, of technology, issues of state and sovereignty, of citizenship. And um, earlier on, uh, industrial development, uh, feminist politics. So she has been, she, her very first book on, and that's the only book on Malaysia, is uh, Spirits of Resistance and Capitalist Discipline, a study based of uh, factory uh, workers in Malaysia, uh, which has now been republished. Then followed by Flexible Citizenship, looking at uh, Asian migrants, uh, global migration of Asians. Buddha is hiding in America, in parentheses. Uh, which is a book of Cambodians, uh, Laotians living in California. Neoliberalism as exception, um, taking on the issues of uh, new economic development globally. And as educator and mentor of young scholars, she has, she has organized several edited books with projects with your graduate students, uh, which uh, includes more recently Global Assemblages, Privatizing China, Socialism from Afar, and a book that is coming up called Asian Biotech. And at the last lecture that I attended that she gave, she is now uh, writing interesting critical commentaries on Chinese art. Tonight is the work based on some of the work that Professor Ong will be speaking on tonight is part of the investigation of the bio biotechnology in Asia and in Singapore. The title of tonight's lecture is Lifelines, the Ethics of Blood Banking for Family and Thank you, Ben Huat, and that for that very uh, insightful introduction. And I'm also grateful to be a fellow at ARI. Uh, you know, I haven't had leave since I got married, which was a long time ago. And this is the first place that I have, have had the chance to, to be at, just to write and think. And, um, and it really is a, a milieu for a restless cosmopolitan. I mean, I think I'm the anthropologist I am because I'm fundamentally a part of the contemporary world which is very, moving very fast, where lots of problems are emerging. And I think that as an anthropologist of the contemporary, this is what one is expected to do. Um, okay. In March 2006, at Sotheby's New York sales room, a Singaporean collector, unfamiliar to Asian art dealers, paid nearly $1 million for the painting of a dazed-looking Chinese man. The painting brought the highest price at New York's first auction of Asian contemporary art. Much of the art was sold, that was sold was politically charged, 
referring to Mao Zedong, Tiananmen, and consumer culture. But the painting in question seems decidedly apolitical, part of the bloodline series of portraits by the Chinese painter Zhang Xiaogang. Zhang has since become one of the most sought-after contemporary artists in global art markets, and his works are shown by the gallery Pace Bildenstein in New York City, which opened a branch ga gallery Pace Beijing in China in 2008. Like other paintings in the Bloodline series, Comrade Number 120 is based on pass passport shots, but projected as they are onto large canvases, each one takes on the more monumental aspect of Chinese ancestor portraits. American art critics frequently note the blank expressions and stiff formality of Tang's figures, many of them clad in proletarian fatigues, as an indication and an indictment of the oppressive degree of uniformity imposed by Mao's authoritarian regime. A description in some of these catalog notes, quote, as the eyes of the sinners stare out at us like, like glistening black pearls, there is a tangible sense of the catharsis for the suffering they have endured." Close quote. Such well-intentioned misreadings rob the authority of the paintings and undercut their intended message. To me, Tang's paintings seem to, seem to capture the fleeting moments of remembering and forgetting in the turbulent family histories of modern China. Tang has said that of his big family series, which seem inspired by upmoded genres of photographic family portraits, that, quote, we are mutually restricted and interdependent, close quote. The power of the bloodline paintings lies in the intertwining material and immaterial elements of Chinese sociality. The red traceries linking family members in group family images indicate the biological that biological matter is always already constituted by kinship. Given the degree of symbolism in Zhang's of, I'm interested in the purchase of this portrait by a young man, of a young man by the wealthy Singaporean. Besides the bloodline motif in the series, there's always already a translucent mark on the otherwise unblemished faces of his subjects. Is this patch a clue of the suppressed self, as some Western observers have suggested? Or is the blemish a kind of DNA marker, or even, even the imprint of medical procedure, a cry for healing invisible wounds. Is the Singaporean's purchase of Comrade Number 120 an act of claiming of reclaiming Chinese ancestry, a tracing of family bloodlines back to the mainland? Or can one read the desire for Tang's works as a search for a new umbilical cord that can sustain the contemporary Chinese family in the face of biological damage? This essay tracks the boom in blood banking in Singapore and the surrounding region as an ethical process of fashioning new lifelines for overseas Chinese navigating the biological risk and pathos of family ruptures. Recent health scares, SARS, avian flu, dengue fever, in Singapore have fueled a sense of renewed biological vulner vulnerability in the midst of modern affluence and have spurred investments in techno-scientific methods as tools of biosecurity. This turn to biomedical procedures opens a window onto the articulation of ethical dispositions at the intersection of the family unit and nation and rejuvenates an old ethical racial solidarity. Indeed, the rise of private blood banking for potential stem cell therapy in the case of future, future illnesses is predicated on the Chinese belief that kinship is grounded in a material shared essence, that is blood, uh, which goes beyond the individual family the individual or the family to include the ethnic kinship. This being so, we should understand the ethics involved in the use of biomedical techniques as not reducible to any single scale, but as engaging different levels of valuation and projection surrounding blood. A novel configuration of biotech, ethical and aesthetic elements in Singapore sets the parameters within which blood and its value are constituted. I propose in this essay to track the many registers and scales that can be discerned in the valuation of blood, and to do so will draw links among official tissue networks, the private banking of cord blood, the promissory marketing of blood banks, and representations such as Zhang Xiaogang's paintings. The first of these, the storage of human tissue by the state, is legitimized in terms of securing citizens' future needs, 
and the embrace of biomedical knowledge and practices is becoming a norm of responsible citizenship. At the same time, private companies advertising cord blood banking uh, boost the promissory value of stem cells, prompting parents to bank the umbilical cord of their infants. The convergence of these different circuits of blood uh, creates a biomedical and ethical network that resuscitates folk beliefs in fixed ethnic essences. The enriched possibilities of blood seem to be echoed in the blood symbolism of the lively market in contemporary Chinese art, giving an aesthetic figuration to the pro projection of diasporic yearnings for material and symbolic connections with the ancestral homeland and emergent world power. Ethical decisions in regard to biomedical questions that are formed at a nexus are formed at a nexus of multiple affiliate that are formed at a nexus of multiple affiliations may raise skepticism in the West in quotation marks. Francis Fuku, uh, Fukuyama has charged that the shift of stem cell research overseas is a form of ethical arbitrage, whereby research institutes relocate to what he calls ethics free Asian environment. He mentions Singapore as an example of a place with quote a more favorable regulatory climate, close quote. But picking on, by picking on Singapore, Fukuyama could not be more off target. The island state is well known as one of the world's centers for enforcing international best practices in business, research, and manufacturing. Indeed, every effort is made in Singapore to make visible adherence to international norms and establishing forms of ethical consensus. Without strict uh, bioethical guidelines in place, the Biopolis Hub could not have taken off as an international site of commercial scientific research. The great centrality of biomedical geno genomics has cast ethical ripples across the social landscape as voluntary biomedical decisions enroll broader eth ethics of collective rejuvenation. Biomedical genomics in Singapore is working in tandem with a mode of governmentality I call vitalist politics. That is, governing through a pragmatic and ethicalized investment in the vital processes of the total living situation. In the island nation, vitalist politics is, is perhaps most visibly realized through the expansion of public re repositories of human tissues for the public good, defining Singaporeans as a biological public freely sharing a common pool of Asian genomic, genomic resources. Organ banks and biomedical insurance help configure an emerging space where medical consumers are encouraged to donate and collect human tissues as an ethical necessity for saving and or extending Asian lives. Public repositories of Asian tissues provide a new biosecurity infrastructure for the nation. And new blood technologies suggest a lifeline cast to future generations and potentially a kind of umbilical cord to vulnerable co-ethnics beyond the immediate family. Conditions that have prompted tiny Singapore to become one of the world's most efficient collectors of human tissues. The most important condition is precisely cord blood banking, which has emerged as a powerful, pragmatic, and symbolic practice that supports the goal of the government to collect human tissues and stem cells that are compatible with the local populations, for example, in the treatment of leukemia, which is regarded widely perceived as an Asian cancer. This small city state is ahead of the United States in this regard, where only a few state governments, among them California, have set up public court banks. Moreover, in the United States, the number of court bank transplants is still small, and the public awareness of court blood as a treatment is still low. Another factor favoring Singapore is its attention to ethics. The collection of research use of human tissue have, of course, been at the center of bioethical debates for decades. In the light of, the, of its ambition to be Asia's foremost biomedical hub, Singapore has been careful in shaping ethical policies. Singapore's model models its research standards and consent, uh, and consent procedures after Great Britain, which legalized therapeutic cloning in 2001. The following year, Singapore approved therapeutic cloning and, and established the Bioethics Advisory Committee. As in Britain, ethical debates were conducted with much, without much fanfare, and ethical concerns, when raised, were muted. An official quote was quoted as saying that the government had considered issues calmly and did not want to draw undue attention to its liberal attitude towards stem cell research 
in case it risks in igniting religious passions. BAC, quote, recognized the need to moderate extreme views at the onset. In other words, it was preemptive. A, a poll of religious leaders found that the main religious groups of Buddhists and Muslims, a combined estimate of 67% of the total population, to be, quote, for therapeutic cloning, unquote. Thus, the bioethics board was a means to build an ethical consensus among diverse religious communities. Back describes its ethical position as just as, and sustainable. I mean, I don't have time to get into the uh, Catholic position, but the Catholics basically were against it. But it, they are a tiny group. But BAC claims itself, you know, it just justifies its ethical positioning in terms of just, uh, justice and sustainability. The claim that it is just refers to, quote, obligation to respect the common good, particularly in the sharing of the costs and benefits of stem cell research. Sustainable refers to its goal to extend the horizon of social obligation, quote, to respect the needs of generations yet unborn, close quote. Under the law, BAC approved ther therapeutic cloning to produce stem cells, as well as taking stem cells from aborted fetuses or surplus embryos from foot fertility treatment. BAC sustainable ethics justified the building of a nationwide system of tissue repositories, a vital infrastructure that makes visible the ethical premise of genomic research. And one of my points is that these, it's not enough to be ethical, it has to be visibilized. Um, indeed, as uh, Sundar Rajan notes, regulatory structures and human infrastructure work hand in hand in new experiments for making ethical subjects. Singapore is a tentative experiment that en enrolls cord blood donation as an ethical practice beyond the consideration of mere biopolitics in the clinic. The larger background of Singapore's biotech ambition is a pronounced sense of political and, and, and environmental uncertainty. In recent decades, Asian milieus have been poised on the edge of biological disasters, the spread of the HIV virus, the SARS epidemic, and then the avian flu. Complex adaptations to health crises and other diseases the 1997-98, I mean, and other disasters, the 1997-98 financial crisis, the tsunami of 2005, have also created a climate of hypersecurity where new problematizations of nation and population are shaped by discourses of population risk and sustainable ethics. Hypervigilance by the state includes the build up of biotechnological and environmental systems in order to securitize the life of the nation. Risk adverse Singapore and Singaporeans are more secu security conscious than other Southeast Asians about the assorted challenges and disasters always looming on the horizon. Biotechnology as industry has become the solution to the threat of economic irrelevance as well in the face of China's emergence as a manufacturing giant. Becoming Asia's biopolis seems to be the new way to re redefine Singapore's distinctive identity. But contrary to Western perceptions, biomedical genomics in Singapore is never simply a commercial undertaking. It emerges as a center of biotechnology in Asia, facilitated its role as a key combatant against the SARS epidemic, as it deployed an array of techniques from screening arrivals in ports to treating SARS patients in state-of-the-art hospitals. Elsewhere, I describe the confluence of biomedicine, surveillance of body heat, and other high-tech um, as surveillance of individuals exposed to SARS. Fear of body heat transmuted into a kind of a political fever, a hypervigilance that primed the population to face further health epidemics. Singapore Christ itself has been more ready to face biological risks than, say, mainland China and other Asian sites, where interventions have been slow or spotty. In the midst of regular outbreaks of infectious diseases, the adaptive mechanisms in Singapore are of a more complex order. And Singapore governing is increasingly focused on technical and ethical investments in what I call the total living situ situation. That is, necessary social practices for, pe for people living in the tropics. And I just want to say parenthesis that Foucault said, argues that modern biopolitical power is fundamentally focused on the population and less on the territory. The growing importance of genetic material in modes of governing and self-governing is crystallizing a notion of citizenship centered on notions of vitalism. Thus, biotech development in response to perceived risk becomes inseparable from practices of sustainable ethics that make visible Asian populations as vulnerable ethnobiological communities. 
This vitalist trust of biotech rule to secure the anxious present is wedded to a neoliberal calculation to tame future unknowns. The very nature of human stem cell research, of which Singer was very proud, and now called blood technology, is based on future probabilities of cures for a spectrum of diseases. The tension between measures instituted to provide biomedical security and biomedical speculations they generate creates risk in many areas of investment, uh, whether in infrastructure or in private tissue banking. But in security-conscious Singapore, the hype of the bio of biomedical shares and added value health insurance seems to encourage risk calculations that speculate on the unknown future. A discourse of genetics, it has been observed, is increasingly used to describe the human condition, clotting everyday consciousness with thoughts about genetically inherited diseases, the screening technologies to detect them, and the need for forms of genetic capital and genetic therapy. Such biomedical instrumentalization alters understanding and frames quote, the way in which life itself can be owned, capitalized, and patented. However, in this Asia milieu, biomedical genomics is viewed as an activity beyond potential commercial gains. In many Asian cultures, body parts and genetic materials have particular resonance for the survival and sense of distinctiveness of nations and peoples. At the same time, biomedical science represents cutting-edge modernity, in the public imagination, there's a growing belief that biobanking is a life-saving gift, as the government has put it, an unavoidable, even ethical necessity for ensuring collective vitality. This belief in the ethical weight of the bioeconomy is constitutive of new relationships between biomedical knowledge and ethical reasoning at multiple scales. Leading experts in education uh, campaigns and biomedical consumers anticipate bio-risky scenarios and the biosecurity measures promised by the life sciences. An array of government inducements has increased enrollment in all levels of scientific research, of science education, I'm sorry, and youngsters are increasingly encouraged to switch from seeking jobs in multinational corporations to training as scientists who may end up working in well-funded labs. As a term of praise, the phrase scientists as heroes was first heard in the combat against SARS, which killed some medical workers. But more recent school campaigns cast leading scientists as rock stars with their own comic book images. Edison Liu, as you know, the head of the Genome Institute, is recognized as the nation's top science hero. Official and corporate discourses in Singapore stress the centrality of the life sciences, not only for the economy, but also for, as usual, the public good. A major aspect of making Singapore a science hub is to have citizens make voluntary contribution to the ever-growing repository for human organs. Singapore is one of the earliest Asian sites to collect hot blood, and, a, and the goal of the public hospitals is to collect 10,000 10, units in order to reach the 80% match for the patients who need, who need it. Cod blood is a vital source of hematopoietic stem cells that are extremely versatile in generating other cells, and are thus a source of potential treatment of heart disease, diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and spi spinal con injury, among others. Now the stress is on potential treatment, because really the treatment's not there yet. Donations are entirely voluntary and donors sign consent forms. The strict bioethical regulations of Singapore uh, give citizens confidence that the use of human materials is ethically and medically sound. As an informant note, Singapore is focused on biotechnical applicants, uh, applications for its own population. The accum accumulation of human organs is, quote, quite pragmatic. These don donations are made only to citizens. It bypasses the need for the sale of organs, which is criminalized. And as you know, the sale of human tissues and organs is strictly forbidden. In establishing a reputation for transparent and ethical regulation in biomedical research, Singapore has sharply distinguished itself from its rival Asian countries, some of which have been criticized by Western observers as lacking, quote, an adequate system of science governance, close quote. Furthermore, the well-regulated Singapore tissue banks are an object lesson for preventing the kind of health situations that occur in China, where HIV and other infectious risks have arisen because of poor regulation of blood transfusions. As Catherine Irwin notes, rampant illegal sales of blood in China have transformed the so-called gift of life into a commodity of death. Singapore's clean reputation is clearly part of a bid to become a significant global player 
and rigor rigorous ethical standards must begin at home. Appeals to both national and private interests to sp spur voluntary contributions to public to a public court blood bank. Quote, parents to be will play a vital role in successfully building up our national life-saving resource, said the director of the blood facility. Quote, the more donated um, umbilical cord bloods we collect and store, the higher the chance of patients in finding a match at a Singapore cord blood bank. Hence, we'd like to encourage more patients to donate their baby's umbilical cord blood, which would otherwise be discarded after childbirth, close quote. Furthermore, there is an appeal to self-interest that articulates ethnicity. The cord blood bank director notes that, quote, because of their unique ethnic immune genome, genome types, 65 to 80% of Asians worldwide currently are, are unable to find a match in blood stem cells, a distinct disadvantage should they need stem cell transplant. Such claims about the need for intra-Asian blood collections were borne out in 2005 when a Singaporean leukemia patient received cod blood from the Shanghai Stem Cell Bank, which has the largest collection in China. The patient's family has con contacted stem cell banks in Singapore, Taiwan, and the Chinese mainland for a genetic match. So at present, I was just recently told by a doctor here, 60% of all births in Singapore take place in public hospitals, and parents are now routinely encouraged to, to donate cod blood to the public bank. The majority of Singaporean Chinese, as we know, are descended from dialect groups that used to be collectively identified as Tang Ren, from southern China. Since 1970s, language policies have reconstituted the, di the dialect groups as a single Mandarin proficient, but largely English-speaking ethnic Chinese population. The new biomedical technologies now add a, a, a scientific heft to historical, cultural, and ethnic affiliations, thus further drawing disparate ethnic Chinese ethnicities in Southeast Asia, Taiwan, and China into a kind of diffuse racial collectivity. The promise of blood transfusion for leukemia has stirred a new kind of altruism as overseas Chinese receive scientific evidence of their long-held beliefs in a Chinese race. Thus, in Singapore and other Asian sites, the bio-value of tissue repositories goes beyond mere commercial gains, becoming the expression of a new moral bioeconomy to treat race-specific problems in a transnational realm. As interest in Singapore's biomedical future heats up, a new, new parents are induced to become more knowledgeable about technology by anticipating bio-risky scenarios and the biosecurity promise, uh, promises offered by the life sciences. In newspaper articles, expect, expectant parents are encouraged to consider a new kind of biological responsibility. Besides finding a name and a nanny for their new baby, young couples must now ponder, quote, the option of taking biological in insurance, that is, Consider storing the baby's cord blood. They must now throw their infant a lifeline for future bio, uh, medical emergencies. All it takes is the collection and storage of blood from the umbilical cord and placenta at the birth of a baby. The news media churned out hopeful stories of potential cures for Asian diseases and the life-saving value of the newborn's blood as a source of stem cells. Writing from the redoubt of Harvard University, a state employed Singapore scientist first acknowledges that it is difficult to dismiss fears that the biomedical sciences may be used in a way that violates the autonomy of the child, as say, by seeking the creation of so-called designer babies. He then offers an alternative view, arguing that, quote, expanding mankind's control over human reproduction is nothing more than an extension of parental responsibility to care for one's offspring, close quote. Such expressions of biomedical hope and new parental responsibilities instill a sense of the need for private blood banking. Because genomic cures are still in the future, there is a speculative dimension to claims about the curative power of stem cells, but the promise of anticipated scientific miracles speaks to the anxiety, anxiety of people eager to be viewed as modern and techno-savvy parents. Beyond media reports, the commercial stimulus behind such beliefs comes from cod life, the first fee for service tissue storage facility in Southeast Asia to be accredited by the American Association of Blood Banks. Founded in 2001, cod life has been praised by the Singapore government 
for contributing to the island's growth as a hub for world-class health care services. The, the founder is Stephen Fung, a British trained Singapore engineer, okay, note that he's an engineer, who has had experiences working with pharmaceutical companies in the United States. Believing that bioentrepreneurship is the new thing, Fung used technologies developed at Harvard and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for stem cell procedures in order to set up commercial blood banking throughout the Asia Pacific region. For this achievement, the company was named Tech Technology Pioneer by the World Economic Forum in 2007, a recognition that gives Fung access to global venture capitalists who gather in Davos. Fung himself was given a Young Entrepreneur Award. He talks to me about the chief motivation behind his business, quote, the pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical business is established with a view to save lives. Changing life is greater than making money, he tells me. Stem cell technology must be made available to the masses, that is, Asians, close quote. The parent company of Cod Life, Cygenex Limited, is registered uh, on the Australian Stock Exchange. Cut Life is the only private blood bank to have AABB accreditation in Singapore, and although it is now extending its reach to North America, it is still mainly focused on providing facilities for storing cod blood in Asia. So it has facilities throughout Southeast Asia and has recently expanded to North in, uh, Asia, India, and Australia. According to Fang, the company's ambition is to build up the blood inventory in order to catch up to current world leaders in stem cell therapy within a decade. This articulation between biocapital, bioethics, and technological advancement is driven home in a variety of educational programs. Fung describes Cotlet as, quote, the caretaker of the client's blood, like a commercial bank with safety deposit boxes, ensuring that the quality and usability of what is banked, and the company's liability, and the um, all right, and he mentions the companies with liability contracts specify a term of 21 years, which is renewable. Fung notes that because Cot Life is the first company in the field, it has been, quote, easy to convince everyone of the need for the service, which it has done by selling, quote, through fear. That is, by presenting data on childhood and teenage vulnerabilities, and by, and by advising that, quote, parental safeguards are needed to protect their children, close quote. On its website, Cot Life urges Asian parents, storing your child's precious cot blood, stem cells, provides you with peace of mind. It can be a child's future key to treatment of more than 80 diseases, close quote. Family cord blood banking will not only secure a private source for potential autologous transplants where the donor and the recipient are the same individual, but also bypass the risky sources of allergenic or donated tissues in a few public repositories throughout Asia. The company claims that responsible parents wishing to protect their children against genetic risk have only one chance, one choice at, at the birth of their infant. The emphasis is on the new way of delivering care, cure, and on engendering a new kind of parental responsibility to invest what is still an uncertain form of therapy. The various reports and statements of the industry and its commentators make it clear that blood banking compares itself to the money market. Oh, it's the wrong picture. Never mind. Sorry. Um, uh, using terms such as banking, insurance, value, capital, and investment in the future. There's much hype surrounding publicly traded biotech firms um, and their dependence on promissory biocapitalist futures to increase their economic value. Capital operates within spe speculative markets in which the prices or the values move in response to the balance of opinions regarding the future movements of prices. But the speculative sto stories surrounding biotechnology markets also contribute to the production of other kinds of values, especially the ethics of responsible health practices. Privatized blood banking can be compared to a speculative market where the opinion of doctors, politicians, and bioentrepreneurs drive the growth of economic and ethical values of family investment in the technology. Cod blood banking can be compared to speculations about the future movement of biomedical value in response to stories of hope instead of the balance of actual cures created available or available. By raising awareness of genetic information, 
predictions of potential therapies add an ethical value to private investments in blood banking, which becomes a family treasure trove of potential cures. Indeed, the Singapore state is reinforcing such understanding by pushing bioinsurance. Parents who bank their newborn's blood with cut life are now covered by NTUC Income, one of the largest state-controlled insurance companies in Singapore. The policy is called Medicord and it has three plans of varying costs. The insurance is sold by speculations about the future. Quote, as more treatments are discovered and cut blood stem cell becomes more widely available, the number of such tra transplants using cut blood is expected to rise in the years ahead. So you see, these are all promissory uh, phrases. Uh, Bioinsurance adds to the spe speculative nature of the tissue economy by adding an ethical value to the practice of family blood banking. The hothouse atmosphere of scientific Singapore raises speculative and in insurable values in cut blood banking, thus creating a realm of what we may call biosubjectivization. The flood of information on genetic illnesses prime family anxieties and bring about two kinds of subjectifying effects. The normalization of hedging biological risks and the interweaving of biomedical practices and ethnic thinking. Company handouts and articles that appear in the media at the rate of one or two a week, that used to be the case, aim to change the family thinking to, uh, about ethnicity. Firm agrees that the overall effect is to strengthen the ethnic identity because of the linking of family blood to the delivery of cure for illness in the family. He then gives an example of a mixed race family who he said should not draw blood, draw on donated blood for fear that it might be incompatible and rejected by their bodies. The private storage of blood from one's children as a means of potential cure will increase the belief and family of a family's ethnic identity. Questions of whether thoughts themselves will be useful as therapies in the long term or in the case of genetically inherited diseases have not been widely discussed. The convergence of biocapitalist and family interests promotes by blood banking as a form of self-governing practice that anticipates and plans for bi biological possibilities in the family's future. The notion of hedging against hazardous biological futures is spreading among ordinary citizens, regardless of whether they have members of the family who can benefit from such practices in the present. Indeed, the private bank of cord blood requires thinking in the present about possibilities of future interventions using stem cell therapy, and such thinking fosters responsibility among parents to hedge against risk in their children's future. This new economic and ethical configuration of parental role goes beyond older, healthy child-rearing norms, such as the immunization of infants. The effect of biomedical information is to relocate an older parental obligation towards children in a new set of possible insurance for a child's future. This new responsibility to participate in what is still a spec speculated biomedical market for the sake of imagined future, uh, imagined future vulnerabilities of one's child may be too demanding in ethics of biosecurity. Nevertheless, at a court, fair, a court life fair I attended in Singapore, many young expectant couples were drawn to the booth for baby gifts and brochures, urging them to sign up right away for court blood storage to the tune of about 1,000 local dollars during the first year and a smaller fee in subsequent years. It appears that cord blood banking is becoming normalized among the younger generations of parents. Newspaper reports about parents having a new baby in order to have provide stem cells for a sick older sibling further reinforce the sense and that the expenses are worthwhile because they can secure the health of more than one family member. The growth of public tissue banking is never enough. Or besides the point, to parents caught up in the need to invest in a hedge fund to profit their children's biological future. At a global level, Catherine Woldeby and Robert Mitchell note that cord blood banking, cord blood, has acquired a speculative value that partakes of the dream of regeneration. The dream that every biological loss can be repaired, close quote. The dream of hedging our bets in the realm of biological risk to children is spreading among this new generation of affluent parents who come to consider cord blood banking as yet another medical responsibility when a child is born. In Singapore, the ethics of this, in, of this form of health management for the affluent is different than the ethical strategies adopted by patient advocate groups who need to work in the interest of sick loved ones, what uh, Nicholas Rose calls uh, biological citizenship. Rather, this, the ethics of investing in cord blood as a possible therapy in the child's future 
is an extension of the ethics of management of risk to which the family group may be exposed into the unknown future. That is a kind of entrepreneurial preemptive action to bank against the, future, the possibilities of future biological risks. Corporate insurance is becoming more than one more element besides insurance of the family home, car, laptop, and so on. In an eth eth ethical materialist ensemble, that knowledgeable Singapore must invest in. Um, the link between blood banking and the expansion of fat parental responsibility strikes a deep resonance, especially among the ethnic Chinese. Singaporean Chinese, no matter how westernized in education, continue to view blood as the substance and symbol of kinship and filial piety. There is such profound and questionable belief in blood connections that kinship ethics cannot be separated from the continuity of family blood lines. In Chinese beliefs, embryos do not have kinship status per se. Okay, but in the Chinese case, this is because only the baby born into the family is a social person. Embryos not used or discarded by the family are non-human and never had kin value to begin with. There is thus the Chinese beliefs uh, in the Chinese belief, a sharper separation between what is considered family tissue and what is judged to be unwanted biological materials that's, that has no symbolic meaning. Not only is there no possibility of moral connection to rejected reproductive tissue, but they are considered part of hospital waste. And, and up until recently, all this stuff is called hospital waste. At a Singapore fertility clinic, a patient told me that her surplus eggs are just waste matter that the government is free to collect for scientific research. Genetic materials such as blood only have symbolic investment when they are part of the originating family or useful for safeguarding its health. Blood is meaningful only when it circulates within the kinship network. The perception of the individual as a cluster of blood cells in a larger configuration of blood is powerfully suggested in this painting of Bai Zhang. It's called The Big Family which depicts a red baby emerging from a family unit composed of figures linked by bloodlines. I'm afraid you can see it, but there's a tracery of, of, of red lines around the figures. The notion of family bloodlines is common in many cultural regimes, but the Chinese have long considered the giving of blood the most powerful expression of interconnectivity and loyalty. Kinship links between families of origin and the family of procreation depend in a material way on the flow of female blood. Female blood carries strong emotional resonance um, because of its association with life-giving and life-sustaining capacities. In the old days, the female blood as a symbol of health and filial love found expression in a daughter's uh, drawing of her own blood to make soup for a sick parent or parent-in-law. As life-givers, women were, are very powerful, but this power to cross life and the symbolic borders is obscured by pollution beliefs about the uncleanliness of female blood. So menstrual blood is very dirty and to be avoided by men. Menstrual and birth blood are out of place, anthropologists argue. That is, they are symbolically unclean, not literally unclean. They are symbolically unclean not because they lack value, but because such bleeding is a forceful reminder of female power and is a threat to male authority. As outsiders, as in a dotted law, an outsider. As outsiders in a still patrilineal culture in Singapore, ethnic Chinese women, in a sense, rely on the birth of sons to anchor themselves in a male-oriented kinship system. Whether these beliefs percolate in the heads of young couples as they eagerly peruse documents at the court life fair, I cannot say. But the easy embrace of this technology, just one more really scientific thing to do in preparation for the baby's future, gives new meaning to the material and symbolic links between the mother and the newborn. When I asked expecting couples why they were interested in court client banking, my question drew blank stares. Of course, we will not do it. We will do anything to protect the health of our baby. To these couples, the question seemed silly. By becoming a biomedical tool, both blood contained contain in a placenta and usually thrown away at a hospital, now enhances the mother's status as the producer of new bio values and endorses the techno-modernity of parents who wish to protect their child against the uncertainties of, future, uh, of the future. The combination of blood bonds and blood storing mechanism uh, promises to give new vitality to ethnic Chinese family values, re-expressing traditional beliefs but also rejuvenating and manifesting them in new ways. 
Folk believes in the regenerative capacity of blood are now com confirmed by the life sciences, further reinforcing the concept of blood as a, a transnational biovalue that Chinese people share no matter where they are located in the world. The possibility of storing this blood for use at a later time and in a different place by one's child or other children bolsters this belief in biological sameness and vulnerabilities. The project of, of collecting blood as a life-saving resource as, as, at the, both the public and the private level is given a, a modern visibility, uh, is giving a modern visibility, visibility to the ethnos as a blood-sharing community. Attempts to sort Asian blood donations by ethnicity in public blood collection uh, drives for leukemia treatments strengthen traditional beliefs in the potency of shared biological essence. The beneficiaries of these public blood drives are not known by the donors. Cut blood banking, by contrast, is a private practice, and donations benefit family members. The family benefit, while paramount for donors, is not the only advantage of private cut blood banking. For the commercial storage of blood uh, preserves uh, genetic materials that can be made available to a wider collectivity should the need arise. So private blood banking is an important supplementary storage system that expands the public tissue uh, network, thus increasing the availability of distinctive strands of Asian DNA for private or public use. This complement complementary relationship of public and private banking broadens the circle of blood sharing beyond the family to the community and a cross-border collectivity of Asian patients needing stem cell therapy. The cumulative effect of giving blood in private arrangements and in public collection drives, creates a biomedical code for deep-seated beliefs in the shared material essence among Chinese people at large. Southeast Asia and sites beyond it are haunted by social upheavals and recurring biological disasters which have marked modern times. Beneath the glittering urban scene, the fate of peoples and nations is still precarious. Added to this complexity, we find techniques of biosecurity and bioinsurability that raise other ethical issues, giving rise to a vitalist politics that sharpen ethnic differences or differences between ethnic groups, and a bioeconomy that is based on the ambiguous projection of future demographic differences and needs. It is clear that bioethics ethics must move beyond the clinic to consider, meaning the study of bioethics, must move beyond the clinic to consider moral decisions and dynamics linked by overlapping scales of risk and ethics. Among the privileged ethnic Chinese of Singapore, the embrace of blood banking can be situated within a transnational network of inherited culture and health dynamics. Maybe I'll skip over all that, all right. Um, New genetic technologies thus suggest new ways for engaging in a kind of social, social auto-production that already proceeds on other fronts. As uh, Sarah Franklin and Susan McKinnon have noted, the substantial codings that might signify kinship include a, a diverse range of phenomena, including genetic disease syndromes, the informatics of computer programming, and family photography. In Singapore, court blood banking may be the substantial coding that signifies an expanded, expanding ethno kinship. The mobilization and concentration of new genetic um, information in blood banking stirs an old ima imaginary of an ethnos that is both historically rooted in shared essence and transnational in scale. Contemporary harnessing of blood prompted by pharmaceutical interests, stirred by biological risk and produced by biotechniques, animates and ramifies a rich kinship symbolism that reverberates across science and commerce. Overseas Chinese have long placed great importance on photographic ancestral portraits, a form that inspires Tang's paintings as a means for registering and tracking kinship connections across time and space. In this light, the acquisition of Tang Xiao Gang's Comrade 120 by a wealthy Singaporean becomes a poignant emblem of acts by overseas Chinese that remember China by reconnecting family bloodlines to mainland ancestor figures. This purchase of an anonymous ancestor seems a symbolic substitution for the dwindling practice of ancestor worship, especially when Chinese in diaspora are separated from the graves of ancestors on the mainland and from the rich soil of cultural China. Now, thanks to private blood banking, the act of preserving bloodlines can be extended literally into the distant future and, and across transnational space. The banking of an infant's blood, like the collecting of ancestral ghosts, 
is a new practice among affluent Chinese who link the ethical decisions they make to safeguard their ch children's health with a remembering of the umbilical cord that connects them back to the motherland. This desire to be linked materially and symbolically to the motherland gains symbolic resonance as well from Zhang Xiaokang's global prominence in the contemporary art world. The aesthetic figuration of modern Chinese experiences and essences in paintings that circulate in global art markets articulates the emerging status of modern Chinese subjects who have the means to perform the ethical role of owning and protecting works fraught with Chinese symbolic value. In a TV interview, Tang said that he paints his black and white faces in order to, quote, depict cloned people as if dreaming, close quote. The faces are poised between amnesia and memory of emotional connections to family members once lost but now recoverable. In his bloodline series, the faint marks like scars that we see on each face form a recurring motif that connects the individual pictures. One painting depicts a red baby's face already marked by some genetic defect, as if signaling the need for biomedical vigilance and intervention by his loved ones. The scar is both a trace of the elusive memory and the imprint of flowing blood lines. These reflections on the Chinese big family, Zhang Kong confides, is crucial to our understanding of life itself. I'm sure most of you would agree that it was an amazing talk that moves from aesthetics, uh, dwells on aesthetics, through science, through family, cultural differences, transnational uh, connections, and ethnicity and nationhood. Uh, the sweep of the topics will leave us much to think about and later on much to much to discuss about. But for now, let me introduce my colleague from the sociology department, Kathleen Koopman, who is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at NUS. Um, she has done, she has a PhD from Oxford University, specializing in science and technology studies, particularly on visual images and visual evidence in scientific discoveries. Um, um, it's uh, both a pleasure and an honor for me to uh, basically provide a short commentary after such a richly textured talk by such a distinguished and influential scholar. So indeed, what I'll try to do is briefly to make some links between uh, what we've just heard or some of what we've just heard uh, and what some of the things that are going on area of science, technology, and society uh, at the Asia Research Institute and uh, at NUS Broadly. So kind of make a link between uh, the work, uh, uh, both what we just heard and also the kind of broader uh, work uh, of IRO and what the Singapore-based faculty who do research and teaching in this area are doing. Uh, and indeed, the comments I'd like to offer are very much inspired by my position as somebody who teaches a module on science, technology, and society uh, to undergraduates at NUS. Most of these uh, undergrads are sociology students, most of them are Singaporeans. Uh, it's also inspired by my position as a member of the Science, Technology, and Society Research Cluster that exists at the Asia Research Institute and at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at NUS. Now this, for those of you who have never heard of it, is a group of academics who share an interest in contextualizing science, technology, and medicine by highlighting its social, cultural, historical, philosophical, political, and literary dimensions. And um, we don't try to do that all at once. Um, so there are several of us approaching this topic from different disciplines, uh, sometimes mixing with a few of them, but uh, not all of them at once. Uh, now, what's particularly pertinent in relation to the talk today is that nine of us are starting work 
on a large collaborative research project on the phenomenon of Asian biotechnology. Our headline question for this project is how is biotech changing Asia? And how is Asia influencing global biotech and bioscience? Within this broad headline, we're scoping smaller projects focusing on pan-Asian genomics, biosecurity, immunology, toxic waste, the specialities of the life sciences, reproductive policies past and present, data mining, and personal genomics. Singapore and its Biopolis are at the heart of this project, but we are also scaling up to include other Asian Biopolis, uh, and you have to take my word for it, Biopolis is the plural of Biopolis. Um, now for all of us, uh, and some of my, my colleagues are, are here today, this project, which is jointly funded by the Ministry of Education and NUS, constitutes a massive opportunity. It's an opportunity in multidisciplinary collaboration and an opportunity to contribute to Singapore's reputation as a key Asian biotech hub by contextualizing what is happening here and by articulating linkages between here and elsewhere, now and in the past, the particular and the general, the concrete and the theoretical. It's also a little scary. And I don't know if I'm just speaking for myself or if others <laughs> share this. Um, but for somebody like me, both teaching science, technology, and society in today's Singapore and embarking on an ambitious project like this with my colleagues on Asian biotech, raises a key question, and it's a big question. What is it that SDS, Science, Technology, and Society, located at the Asia Research Institute at NUS and in Singapore more broadly, should be doing? Now, in recent weeks, I had the good fortune of being exposed to not just one, but two influential people whose insights, I feel, can help me and perhaps us begin to formulate an answer to that question. What is it that SDS should be doing? One of those people is Professor Ivan Ong. And I think it's very clear from the talk we've just heard, uh, and I also uh, had the good fortune to uh, uh, see the introductory chapter of the forthcoming book on Asian biotech. I think it's very clear that that book is going to be a key touchstone uh, for us uh, here in, in Singapore as we embark on, on this project. Um, it's a key touchstone because it manages to set out an agenda and outline a terrain that is very rich, very complex, uh, and in which there's much still to do. Uh, and yet offers a number of uh, resources for navigating through that terrain. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute, but first I want to mention the other influential, influential person, and that is uh, Edison. Um, he was already mentioned by uh, Prof. Bong in her talk just now. Hailed as Singapore's top scientist, he's the executive director of the Genome Institute of Singapore, and the president of the Worldwide Human Genome Organization. He's a very visible figure, adept at interacting with media and policy makers, and somebody with a network that includes top scientists from many disciplines in many countries. He's a sponsor or uh, advisor on this Asian biotech project I already, already told you about. And last week, our team together with Professor Ong, uh, we met with him for a discussion. And to me, during that meeting, Edison Liu, through his anecdotes, his comments, and his suggestions, presented to us a model of what doing top science in the area of genomics is also about, apart from um, what goes on in the labs 
and the computers that enable the production of this kind of scientific knowledge and its applications. It's also about engagement. Engagement with government, with other scientific disciplines, with social scientists. Edward is very good at engaging social scientists. Uh, and with the public. Part of this, and perhaps typical of the exemplary entrepreneur he is, is to do with knowing, in his words, who your paymasters are and what's important to them. Another part is to be innovative in considering not only who might be engaged, but also how. You mentioned initiatives to train ethnic minority groups, indigenous populations in the Philippines and Mexico, um, to train them to analyze their own genomic data. So these are initiatives that scientists are involved in. Um, and this is disrupting traditional divides between researchers and their subjects and moves away from uh, the situation in which certain populations become data resources for other people to mine and profit from. He was also very interested in one of our colleagues' uh, proposal to study personal genomics. So uh, more popular applications where people go online to trace their ancestry, for example, uh, as a key area that could uh, help in the popularization of genomic science. Now here, I think, lies part of the answer to our question of, well, as yes, it's in a crucial. A second part finds its inspiration in the work of Professor Ayrot Mom. And um, I think the vocabularies that she's providing us with, um, vocabularies, for example, to do with assemblages. Uh, and she also talks a lot about skills skills of exception, skills of ethics, are important because they talk about and help get at the conditions of possibility that crystallize out of political, cultural, and technical practices. Uh, and they also, conditions of possibility that then in turn shape lives, livelihoods, and ways of relating. And in the talking about skills, there's also a very important emphasis that these conditions of possibility or the meanings that can be made around um, uh, uh, you know, modern, modern life and what biotech has to do with it can and often are multiple and overlapping or intersecting. Now, while of course such language, such language complicates things, I think this is a necessary complication to grasp crucial interlinkages of science and society, science and culture, and science and politics, and politics, which provide both possibilities and constraints on how each of us live our lives and define ourselves in relation to others today. I was always quite masterful in articulating what things have to do with one another. Now, earlier today, a taxi driver told me about his four daughters, one of whom just started her studies at MIT, with another already finished and working in the Boston biotech industry. Would she consider coming back to Singapore, I asked, seeing that there's also a burgeoning life sciences industry here. He was scathing about that prospect, saying that Singapore is very bad, mostly for offering its own citizens only peanuts in terms of pay. As a foreigner, me. The same man chided me for speaking a little Singish, which he said he would not allow in his children or grandchildren. I blame the influence of my students. And, he said, he was working around the clock to pay for an upcoming holiday with children and grandchildren, a family of 16 in all, to the Australian Gold Coast. Now, these seem fairly random topics. But they actually survey various forms of both individual choice and proper citizenly middle class behavior that implicate the biological and the ethical. The man mentioned that he was hoping for one more grandchild. Uh, all the grandchildren uh, are boys. He's hoping for a girl. Maybe if she gets born, he will be working around the clock again 
to open a corporate account for. Now my taxi driver's life and that of his family in a few casual anecdotes I think reflects some of the opportunities and risks entailed in what it means to be Singaporean today. Meanings that reference national and transnational bioethical assemblages. Working on a research project out of NUS on Asian biopolice, it is clear that we should be looking at some of these different, sometimes overlapping skills that constitute modern biotechnology or life sciences developments in Asia. Identifying these skills following IOO, I think it's not a matter of applying some standard micro lenses of micro lenses that some of us in the social sciences are familiar with, but of choosing quite concrete practices, developments, or initiatives in which modern technoscience resonates with family life, with jobs, expertise, livelihoods, and with the history and political preoccupations of nation states. Blood bank, as we've heard tonight, is such an example in which different scales of attachment and the consideration of various relationships of an individual with his or her family, community, nation, kin, continent, become manifest. These help us ask questions regarding why do some choices, options, and possibilities become more viable or seem more viable in an economic, political, or personal sense than others, and ask these questions in a fairly precise and sensitive manner. Now, a project on Asian biopolis out of NUS also needs to grapple with the issue of what it means to talk about Asia. And here, Professor Ong's work is crucially important in suggesting that we seek to understand both the differences in how various Asian countries do biotech, while at the same time noting points of convergence. These points of convergence make it worthwhile to speak of Asian biotech as, and I'm using Ong's phrasing here, this is from the introduction <coughs> as a regional sphere of scientific imagination and endeavor, a sphere that defines itself in relation to the West, but also in relation to the bio-risks and hazards plaguing the region, and in relation to historically and politically inflected notions of what is good, proper, and desirable. Articulating Asia means being sensitive to the various ways in which Asia articulates itself. And it means drawing together the logics of politics, technology, and culture. Okay, so um, I think that Professor Ong's work helps uh, answer the question what STS uh, in Singapore should be doing uh, in, in two ways. One is to do with you know, how do we talk about Asia, and the second, the one which I mentioned first is to do with how, how do we grapple with this multiplicity and the complexity of the relationships that are being uh, woven and, and interwoven around, around biotechnology. The third response or answer to the question of what SDS in Singapore should be doing, for that I'm, I'm going to go um, refer back to, uh, to Edwin one more time. And here I think for a project like ours, we should think about pioneering various modes of engagement, about experimenting with engagement. So, um, and this is this I think has to do both with uh, trying to develop a sort of reflexivity of what it means to do, to be doing a project like this uh, in a context like Singapore, asking who our main masters are and what. Uh, is important and relevant to them, and how we might engage that, uh, you know, engage that maybe as a productive tension with uh, the kind of work that people in the Asia Research Institute and in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences want to do. But also, um, experimenting with how we deal with um, research, uh, with re 
research relationships, basically. So alongside interviewing scientists, policy makers, and others, and alongside observing events as they're happening, or observing work in, work in action in the laboratories, we are beginning to think about alternatives like public or semi-public events where one scientist might be interviewed by several people, or maybe more like a focus group discussion, um, or art events where people are invited to participate in things like biohacking or um, other experimental forms of engaging with, with biotech um, and ethics and um, modes of, you know, and, and thinking through what it means for, for our lives uh, here in Singapore and beyond.